Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual and distance high holiday services. I can tell from the echo in the room, even now, how different it is from the way we are used to celebrating. Why is this Rosh Hashanah night different from all other Rosh Hashanah nights? This is not the celebration we would have chosen. I miss the energy and excitement of people, the crowded parking lot, the choir lined up in the fellowship hall, the hundreds of voices raised together in song. We do not get to choose the world in which we live. As humanists, as humanistic Jews, as human beings, we have the duty to face reality as it is and then do our best to make meaning and beauty and fellowship and inspiration out of that reality. And that is what we will do tonight. I welcome everyone who is participating in this from wherever you are and whenever you are. This is our first video recorded High Holidays and it will probably not be our last as so much else in the world will be different in years to come. This Jewish year of 5780 has been different from all other years in so many ways, especially since Purim in mid-March. We welcome the arrival of 5781, and we are hopeful for a better year. After all, the bar was set very low by 5780. However, this new year has not begun well. As many of you know, this evening, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice, passed away. We are left with many questions and not a lot of answers. The question of how this happened is straightforward. We know about cancer. She was 87 years old. No one lives forever. The question of why also leaves us empty. We don't see this as part of a cosmic plan or that there was a purpose, a design behind this moment of tragedy. The most important question we have is what now? What happens next and what do we do? And the answer to that is the same answer we've had in humanistic thought from the beginning of our movement, from the beginning of the human experience. The answer to what now is human action, raising our voices, acting together, working for the result we want to see in the world. And so I invite us to rededicate ourselves to that purpose over the coming weeks and months and to make action the best and lasting tribute that we can offer. Tonight is also Shabbat, that pulse of six days plus one that defines the rhythm of Jewish time. It is a time and space for quiet, for reflection, for connection. Wherever you are, whatever your surroundings, I invite you into this space to enter Shabbat, to enter the Jewish New Year, to enter this opportunity for meaning and beauty and fellowship and inspiration. Those of you who have our service booklets, I invite you to turn to the beginning of the Rosh Hashanah evening service. You may have also had them emailed to you. And if you didn't and you want to have the service ready for tomorrow and for Yom Kippur, please contact our office and we can send you that to print out and have available. We begin with a song that welcomes Shabbat and hopefully enters us into that space of peace and calm. The song is Bim Bam, and the other words are Shabbat Shalom, which wishes each other a Shabbat, a moment of stopping of peace. Bim bam, bim 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 bam, bim 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 bam, bim bam, bim 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 bam, bim 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 bam. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom, Shabbat 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 shalom. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom, Shabbat 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 shalom. Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat shalom. Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom. Shabbat 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 shalom. Bim bam, 
Bim, 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 bam. Bim, 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 bam. The Jewish New Year begins in darkness. We are the light. In Leviticus, the first day of the first fall month is to be a Shabbaton, an absolute halt, and Mikra Kodesh, a sacred assembly. It is also Zichron Teruah, a memorial of shofar blowing. As the first day of a Jewish month, this assembly of the shofar always begins in the darkness of a new moon. Neither faith nor human effort are needed for the glimmer of a new moon to grow into brilliance. The full moon shone long before humanity appeared and will outlast all of us. Yet even when the night is dark, we are not defeated. Our minds, our hands, our culture work together to bring time to eternity, light to darkness, meaning to moments. When the world is dark, as the Jewish New Year begins, we are the light. Each moment we think we are still, we move through time and space. We feel alone, yet we are connected through law and custom, ancestry, biology, affinity and enmity, shared experience of fear and isolation. Days became weeks, became months. The bliss of quiet faded to the weight of solitude. We called and we wrote to escape our few rooms, learn to FaceTime and Zoom, and maybe bake sourdough bread. But the timing was off, the spacing too far, the world just seemed askew. Now we find ourselves on the threshold, somewhere between opening up and shutting down. What can heal us? Is it time and patience? Is it space and distance? Is there nothing we can do? Or is going nowhere the best we can do? So with Corona, so too Rosh Hashanah, on the threshold between opening and shutting. What can heal? Time and patience, space and distance. What can we do? What we need is what we have, time, and space. Let us give ourselves these gifts, this time and this space, this moment, now. Birds flying high, 
You know how I feel Sun in the sky You know how I feel Breeze drifting on by You know how I feel It's a new dawn It's a new day It's a new life For me And I'm feeling good I'm feeling good Fish in the sea You know how I feel River running free You know how I feel Blossom on a tree You know how I feel It's a new dawn It's a new day It's a new life For me And I'm feeling good Dragonfly out in the sun You know what I mean, don't you know? Butterflies all having fun You know what I mean Sleep in peace when day is done That's what I mean And this old world is a new world And a bold world for me A fall Sands of the pine, you know how I feel. Oh, freedom is mine, and I know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, there shall be a solemn service, a time to refrain from work, a day of commemoration proclaimed to the sound of the shofar, a sacred assembly. Please say with me where you are, sound the shofar on the new moon in the time appointed for our festival day. Tekia. <laughs> Shivarim Terua Yeah. 
Who can ignore the sound of the shofar? Raucous and discordant, it ties us to the past and shocks us out of reveries. We are called upon to reflect, but we are also called to action. Together, the blast of the shofar awakens us to see the world as it is, to see ourselves as we are. It calls us to strive for a just and peaceful world. The shofar challenges us to become what we are capable of becoming. May the sound of the shofar not fall upon deaf ears. The shofar evokes strong and elemental forces, urges and fears. It calls us to take account of these forces with ourselves in our reflection about the coming year. This day is known as Yom Teruah, the day of sounding, and Yom Hadin, the day of judging, which we understand as self-reflection, self-examination. We listen to the voice within. We spend these days reflecting on where we have been and where we are going, for our future must be informed by our past. Say with me. May this day help us to find meaning and fulfillment in our lives. Let the shofar's call awaken the voice of our conscience. Tekia. You don't have to be Jewish to love Levi's Rye. You could be black, Italian, a Cherokee with very large teeth grinning over a corned beef sandwich. 
You don't have to be Jewish to love. Certainly or uncertainly. You don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's rye. Or to love anything. A single caraway seed. Or in the rough black seed of the four o'clock, enclosed in pastel petals late afternoon. You know it's there and you don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to be Jewish to walk a mile with the sun going down Rosie in the park. Or to love Rosie in the park. Or at home. And Rosie loves you back. You don't have to be Jewish to chew slowly. Tasting the rye breaking down into sugar. You just have to be willing to slow down time to a poster. A still photograph of you in your ethnic garb in the days when ethnicity was okay, not yet terrifying or indistinct. Kiss me, I'm Irish. And kiss me again, I'm gay Italian Chinese. And no parking. This space reserved for Polish. You don't have to be Jewish. You could be anything amazing. Or distinct. You could have just once. For maybe an hour. A day. Forgotten you were different. You don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to be. To love. To love bread. You don't have to be rye to love Jewish. But it helps. Wisdom is an awesome power. Through the force of their reasoning minds, human beings have tamed the energy of the sun, surpassed the birds in their reach for the heavens, multiplied the elephant's strength a millionfold, and through the miracle of language, we learn the thoughts, hopes, and dreams of ancient civilizations and transmit our knowledge to yet unborn generations. In our time, the explosion of knowledge has confirmed the truth that wisdom is larger than any one text, broader than one people's experience. Torah is not a thing, but a process. The scroll is but a symbol of the dynamic unfolding of truth, which began when the first question was asked and will continue until the last human being breathes her last. We honor our symbol of truth that we may honor every person who has ever brought truth to light. At this time in our Rosh Hashanah services, we share wisdom from the writings of our people in our cultural inheritance. And so wherever you are, I invite you to rise as we remove our Torah scroll from the ark to the words of the book of Proverbs. It is a tree of life that is wisdom and its supporters are happy.
from the book of Numbers, chapter 12. Vatidaber Miriam va Aharon ba Moshe al odot ha isha ha kushit asher lakach, ki isha kushit lakach. Vayomru harak ach ba Moshe diber yave, halo gam banu diber, vayishma yave. Vaha ish Moshe anav maod mikol ha adam asher al pene ha adama. Vayomer yave pit om el Moshe ve el Aharon ve el Miriam, tsu shloshtam, shloshtachem, El Oel Moed, Vayitz U Shloshram, Vayered Yave, Vaamud Anan, Vayamod Petach Ha Ohel, Vayikra Aharon U Miriam, Vayitz U Shnehem, Vayomer, Shimuna Divarai, Im Yihie Neviachem, Yave Bimare Elav, Vayet Vada Bachalom, Adaberbo, Loken Avdi Moshe, Behol Beti Neeman Hu, Hail pe adaber bo, umar e, ve lo bachida, ve tumunat yave yabit, umadua lo yiratem le daber ba avdi ba moshe, ve yichar af yave bam, ve yelech, ve haanan sar me al ha ohel, ve hine miriam metzoraat kashaleg, ve yipen aharon el miriam, ve hine metzoraat, ve yomer aharon el moshe, Bi Adoni, Alna Tashet Alenu, Khatat Asher no Alnu va Asher Khatanu, Alna Tehe Kemet, Asher Bzeto Mirechem Imo, Va Ye Achel Khatsi Besaro, Va Yitzak Moshe El Yave Lemor, Elna Refana La, Va Yomer Yave El Moshe, Va Aviha Yarok Yarak Befaneha, Halo Tekalem, Shivat Yamim, Tesagir Shivat Yamim, Mihuts La Machane. Ve'achar te'asef. Ve'tisagir Miriam mechutz l'machane shivat yamim. Ve'ha'am lo nasa ad he'asef Miriam. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite, the African woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has Yahweh indeed spoken only with Moses? Hasn't he spoken also with us? And Yahweh heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the surface of the earth. Yahweh spoke suddenly to Moses, to Aaron, and to Miriam. You three come out to the tent of meeting. The three of them came out. Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. He said, Now hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, Ah, Yahweh will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. He is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even plainly and not in riddles. He shall see Yahweh's form. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Yahweh's anger burned against them, and he departed. The cloud left from over the tent, and behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. Aaron looked at Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Aaron said to Moses, O my Lord, please don't count this sin against us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Let her not, I pray, be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. Moses cried to Yahweh, saying, Heal her, God, I beg you. Yahweh said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, shouldn't she be ashamed for seven days? Let her be shut up outside of the camp for seven days, and after that she shall be brought in again. Miriam was shut up outside of the camp for seven days, and the people did not travel until Miriam was brought in again. Before the events of this year, I would not have chosen this text to explore for our high holidays. But a text that touches on family dynamics under pressure, racial discrimination, unfair treatment of a woman, a sudden disease and the desire for healing. If I did not know better, I might have imagined it was written for this moment. A Torah reading can be like a Rorschach test. Our interpretation may reveal as much about us as it does about the text. Is this story cruel or compassionate, just or unjust? Consider various moments. 
Are Miriam and Aaron justified in their complaints of Moses' transgression for marrying out, especially a Kushite or African woman? Or is their ethnocentric, even racist bias, the real sin? Is the Hebrew God justified in his anger on behalf of Moses at their rebellion? Note that just a few chapters later in the book of Numbers, another rebellion against Moses by Korach the Levite will result in hundreds of deaths. Does it make sense if Moses supposedly wrote the five books of Moses that it says Moses was the humblest man who ever lived? Would the humblest man who ever lived brag about it? This is aside from the claim that Moses gets the best revelations, even seeing the image of God that God isn't supposed to have, according to other parts of the Torah. But these are topics for another time. Recall that Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are all siblings. Moses is the youngest of the three. Could this be a story of sibling rivalry? Notice that they complain about his wife. Evidently, dealing with in-laws has never been easy. When I read Yahweh saying suddenly, you three come to my office, and Miriam and Aaron come out here, I hear an angry parent talking. And it is not an accident that the examples given by both Aaron and by Yahweh are family dynamics. Aaron subtly reminds Moses that all three of them came from the same womb. And Yahweh describes Miriam's punishment like the shame of a rebellious daughter being corrected by her father. Miriam is struck by a plague of divine origin, and Moses prays to that same divinity for healing. In our era of global pandemic, we debate the same theological question of the source of the disease and the source of healing. Are they the same? Are they aware and listening? Or are we on our own to face a silent and indifferent universe with the power of human caring and human healing? perhaps most challenging. You might have noticed that both Miriam and Aaron complain against Moses, but only Miriam is struck with disease. The very first verb of the passage, vatidaber, is a feminine form, perhaps subtly blaming Miriam a little bit more. Perhaps Aaron's duties and privileges as high priest prevented him from facing the same consequences as Miriam. Aaron needed to stay pure to offer sacrifices, so he was too important to be punished. Aaron does appeal for Miriam to be healed, or maybe he's just afraid for himself to be next. It is heartening to read that the community did not leave until Miriam was rehabilitated, but it is disappointing to see a double standard with a woman on the short end again. I have my own verdict on the injustice of this story but we are a jury of the whole Jewish people and of those of other heritage who celebrate with them tonight. Whom would we condemn and whom would we forgive? How will we write our own stories of family dynamics under pressure, racial discrimination, the unfair treatment of women, and a surprise disease that threatens to spread? That story is up to each of you. Again, I invite you to rise as we return our Torah scroll to the Ark.
Old rituals are comforting. They are familiar and predictable. They are safe and secure. They relieve us of the pain of continuous surprise. They reflect the mood of stability and eternity. Old rituals help us relax because they require no more exertion than the effort of repetition. But endless repetition is dull, just as people without imagination are boring. Imitation and conformity are necessary for survival. They are not enough for happiness. Successful people are creative people. They refuse to accept the world as fixed. They refuse to believe that life offers only one script for living. They see old things and imagine new ways of putting them together. They see new things and fancy old settings which they will transform. They gaze at one scene and envision a hundred ways to describe it. They experience one life and imagine a thousand ways to live it. The power of accident. Someone laid the petals in the big dictionary again. We always do that, placing such things in heavy books, wishing to hold on to what we know will inevitably pass. But have you noticed how perfectly they were located? Pressed there between metalwork and meter, directly under metaphor. Surely, that is what they are now. Their luminous bodies and lustrous flesh have gone where summers go and the only veins remain as testament to the sweet sap that ran with the solstice. But I will bet that it was just chance that defined those petals so well. Chance can set things right. I mean, I mean look at us, what we are, how we met in the deep waters between metalwork and meter, and then how we have come to cleave together tighter than the weave woven of the shadows in the woods, thicker than the juices that run through all the golden veins of summer.
The turning of the seasons is a time of memory, a time of reflection. We think back on losses of the past year. All over the world, those losses have been much more than anticipated, more than we planned for, more than had to happen. Shortly before the end of this Jewish year, before sundown, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away as well. She was a hero to many, an inspiration to others, and a defender of human rights. But we have loved ones who were not famous, who were not in positions of high authority, and they nevertheless has a, had a positive impact on our lives. Their gifts of love and teaching, raising us and raising us to be loving and caring people. These are the gifts we remember in this season when a spot is empty at a table, no one answers the phone, and we wait to see what will happen in the year to come. Wherever you are, I invite you to stand for a moment. It is a moment of tribute. It is a moment of memory. It is a moment of connection between the present and the past. We are connected to the past by bonds of love that do not splinter and do not break. And so let us feel those ties to those who came before and let us remember them with great love. If you were Moses, what would you do? You see a bush on fire that is not consumed. A voice calls you by name. It claims to be the God of your ancestors. It has heard the suffering of Hebrews enslaved, and it promises to deliver them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then the voice says, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring out my people, the children of Israel, from Egypt. What would you do? This is no cough medicine hallucination. You did not choose this situation. Until recently, you had a comfortable life, an adopted son of Egyptian royalty. You fled Egypt after killing an overseer who was beating a Hebrew slave. And now you are being asked to go back to the scene of your crime, to address your people's suffering, to challenge power face to face. What does Moses do? He asks a question. Who am I that I should confront Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? A simple yet profound question. Who am I? It is simple because early in life, we learn to respond to the sound of our own names. Even coma patients sometimes show brain activity when they hear their names. Who am I is also profound, because if you do not know who you are, how can you know others? How can you experience the world if not from the fixed point of the self? 
This question can be an escape, hiding behind the anonymity of a, just a normal person. Who am I, meaning I am really nobody, and a nobody does nothing. This question can also be a challenge. Who am I really? Am I the person I want to be? Who am I can be an out or a commitment. Which would you have chosen as Moses? Which do you choose today? This high holiday season, we explore Jewish questions. For us, being Jewish is our particular subset of the human experience. Some Jewish questions are Jewish specific. Which haroset recipe for Passover do you like the best? What lessons do you draw from the Jewish experience? Other Jewish questions speak to the human condition. The very act of asking questions is both very Jewish and very human. As far as I know, every language has words for why and how. The universal human quest for why and how is the basis of science and history and knowledge based on evidence. Jews do not have a monopoly on asking questions, just as we do not have a monopoly on guilt, ask any ex-Catholic. Yet asking questions can still be very Jewish. For example, a key element of the Passover Seder is the four questions. One way that we humanistic Jews differ from our forebearers is that we are more open to new answers, to heretical answers and questions, even to challenging the questions themselves. To be fair though, one of Moses' defining characteristics is his chutzpah, his nerve. When Noah was told to build the ark and save only his family, he asks no questions. When Moses is commanded, he asks many questions, starting with, why me? More precisely, who am I that I should confront Pharaoh? Perhaps Moses suspects there will be more to do than just snap his fingers to free the Israelites. Spoiler alert, Moses' work will not be over from now until the end of the Torah when he dies in the very last chapter. After the burning bush, there will be 40 more years of leading, negotiating, and arguing to get this stubborn, stiff-necked people to the promised land. In our own days, you do not need me to tell you that we face many challenges. We face them as Americans, as part of the Jewish family, and as human beings. The Passover Haggadah describes 10 plagues that Moses inflicts on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. The year 2020 has 10 plagues beaten very easily. In no particular order, racism, sexism, homophobia, hyperpartisanship, rising temperatures and extreme weather, policing and the criminal justice system, poverty and hunger, domestic violence, constitutional crisis du jour, massive budget and pension shortfalls, healthcare, automation and job disruption, government corruption, cyber privacy and the pitfalls of social media, immigration policy, hurricanes and killer wasps. And of course, the plague of coronavirus, which includes illness, death, shutdowns, school openings, school closings, economic disruption, video conference overload, and a Rosh Hashanah when we are together emotionally but the sanctuary is empty. Facing all of our plagues, our pharaohs, we also ask, why me? Who am I to confront all of this? And for how much longer? The challenges are overwhelming and we have no confidence in a guaranteed happy ending. In the real world in which we live, there is no promised land flowing with milk and honey no pillar of cloud by day and fire by night to show us exactly where to go, no miraculous hand and outstretched arm fighting for us. Yet the people we deal with are just as stubborn and stiff-necked as ever. And we are not Moses. Of course, at the start of his saga, even Moses was not Moses. He was uncertain, asking for help, looking to avoid responsibility. A leader after 40 years had better be different than a leader in year one. 
I once was preparing for a funeral for a woman who had lived well into her 90s. And so I met with her children first, who were seniors themselves by this point, and they had had a very challenging relationship with their mother while they were growing up and when they were small children. Over the next couple of days before the memorial service, I talked separately with her grandchildren, and they had experienced her very differently. For them, she was a loving, generous, caring, interested grandmother who was very involved in their lives. Now, those who are grandparents can tell you that parenting and grandparenting are very different. But it is also different because the adult is different. This grandmother who had died was 30 years older and wiser with different responsibilities from when she had been a mother to small children. Every one of us has had experiences we look back on today and say, if only I'd handled that differently. We cannot expect to have lived our lives then with what we know now. Part of letting go of the misdeeds and omissions at the Jewish New Year, whether those of our own or those of others, is to not expect anyone to have been perfect from the beginning. It does not matter that we are not yet Moses. We will probably never be Moses. A Hasidic story makes the point very well. Rabbi Zusia once said, in the coming world, they will not ask me, Zusia, why were you not Moses? Instead, they will ask me, why were you not Zusia? We do not have to be Moses, and we do not have to solve every problem I listed to make a difference. We do have to be our version of Zusia, our best self, and we do have to act because not acting is also a choice no matter who you are. Yes, the pharaohs we face are daunting. Some pharaohs are systemic from the founding of a nation, be it race in America or Arabs in a self-defined Jewish state and the territories it controls. Some are the result of generations of bad decisions and short-sighted leadership unable to make hard choices. Some are unforeseen consequences of good intentions some are the results of cruelty, indifference, or a lack of empathy. We'll talk more about that last problem of empathy tomorrow morning when we ask another Jewish question, am I my brother's keeper? For the moment, though, imagine that you are at a summer camp, standing at the deep end of the pool during the first period when it's still chilly out. You know that the water will be cold when you jump in. You know that you get better every time you swim, and once you start swimming, the water will not feel as cold. And you know that going in one toe at a time will be just as cold and take much longer to get through. The hardest part is making that decision to take the leap. We can certainly get more information before we act, dip a toe in the water, ask a friend who had already jumped in. Moses himself asks many questions. You can imagine this dialogue in an instant message format. Go free the Israelites from Pharaoh. Who am I to go to Pharaoh to free the Israelites? Don't worry, I'll be with you. The Israelites will ask me later, so tell me now. Who are you to send me? In other words, who dis? Tell them I am the God of their fathers and they will listen. What if they don't believe me and think I imagined all this? Here are some signs and wonders. Make your staff into a snake and back, turn your hand leprous and then heal it. And if those don't work, we'll turn the Nile to blood. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, maybe slow of thumb. Please send someone else. You get the sense that Moses really does not want the job. We could make our own excuses to avoid acting. I did not create the problem, even if I may benefit from it. I am not trying to hurt anyone. These problems are beyond my ability to solve. I have no status that people should listen to me. I'm no Moses. I'm not even Azusia. And I do not even know enough to know where to begin, even if I decide to act. These excuses may all be true, but they are not good enough to do nothing. We can all move the ball forward, even if only a little. In Pirkei Avot, the sayings of the fathers, Rabbi Tarfon said, the day is short and the work is plentiful. 
The workers are lazy and the reward is great, and the master of the house is insistent. It is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you free to neglect it. Tarfon clearly believed there was a master of the house, a god, directing the action, and a cosmic reward for doing his will. Even without master or reward, for us, the day is still short. There is still plenty of work, and we cannot rely on others to get it done. Sometimes if you want something done right or done at all, you have to start it yourself. Who am I that I should confront Pharaoh? We reject this question as escape. We may not finish the work, but we are not free to neglect it. Instead, it is a commitment. What do we each have in our personal toolbox to bring to bear to the problems we face? It may be more than we realize. Some of us have financial resources. The need for tzedakah or righteous giving is deep for many worthy causes, and you can find people doing good work consistent with any political or religious ideology. But generosity is not a function of raw dollars. Did you know that those who earn less money often give a higher percentage of their income in charitable donations? In 2016, among those who itemized on their taxes, those earning 50 to $100,000 donated 1% 1 more of their adjusted gross income than those earning $500,000 to $2 million. The higher earners gave more dollars but were less generous. Amazon tycoon Jeff Bezos has a net worth around $200 billion. If he donated $20 million, that would be the same as someone worth $200,000 donating $20. Do not ask why you cannot be Bill Gates. Look at where you are and go from there. Some of us have educational resources. We are good at reading or writing or explaining complex issues. We can deepen our understanding of the challenges, their origins, their persistence, their possible solutions. We can motivate others to change behavior or work for the good. We can connect with family and friends who might listen to us when they do not listen to strangers. Moses' first worry is not whether Yahweh will convince Pharaoh to free the Israelites. Moses doubts that the Israelites will believe it can happen, so he has to convince them first. If change starts at home, we can start by connecting with the minds and hearts of those whom we know best. Some of us have privilege. I know this is a loaded term, but year after year, We've spoken here of the need for nuanced understandings, and here is another opportunity. You can be privileged in some ways and disadvantaged in others. Ashkenazi Jews are not white to Nazi white nationalists, but they may be treated as white by loan officers or police officers. Speaking personally, I am definitely white if I go to the beach without sunblock. Acknowledging privilege does not mean apologizing for something you did not do or being shamed for who you are. This is not the oppression Olympics where the most suffering wins. If you do have inherited wealth or visually white skin or standard English, you start the race of life some steps ahead of those without those advantages. We sometimes hear an absolute choice, either equality of opportunity or equality of result. Either everyone has an unweighted fair opportunity to succeed on merit alone, or equal end results are imposed through boosting some and weighing down others. In the real world, we all get to that starting line from different beginnings, through different experiences with different assets. If certain names or accents or skin colors are less likely to get a good education or housing or equal treatment by the system, then we need to pay special attention to what happens before the starting line in order to have a real equality of opportunity. What do we do if we are on the more fortunate side of perceived race and education and income? We use it to do good. Moses was an Israelite adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. He had privilege. 
He did not have to intervene to save the Hebrew being beaten by the Egyptian taskmaster, which he did long before he ever heard that voice from the bush. After the killing, Moses had escaped far away from Egypt. He went back to Egypt to help others. So too did the 19th century Moses, Harriet Tubman, who escaped from slavery in 1849, only to return 13 times to rescue at least 70 fellow slaves. She did not free herself and then leave others to do the same. She went back at great risk to herself to help and show them the way. All of us have opportunities. We do not have to wait for a burning bush or a voice from the heavens to act. We no longer need freedom riders on interstate buses. We need freedom walkers, freedom voters, freedom citizens who can still make a difference. To make that difference, we have to accept the challenge of who am I? What are my values? And how valuable are my values to my sense of self? When Moses meets the burning bush, it is an external authority, a God who tells him what he must do. Even if Moses asks some questions, he knows and the readers know who is really in charge. Our task today is more challenging. If we ask, who am I that I should confront today's pharaohs? We do not expect an answer from beyond. The answer must come from within. You do not have to be a prophet, a Moses, a God. You are Zeusia. You are Harriet. You are you. You are the only you there is. And if you do not bring who you are and what you have to push for the changes you want to see, then you will have missed this unique opportunity, a moment that will never come again. Later in the sayings of the fathers, we read, there are three crowns, the crown of Torah, the crown of the priesthood, and the crown of royalty. But the crown of a good name is greater than all of them. What makes your name good or even great? You do. So make your name great by what you do with who you are. Call received. Answer awaited. Just a few announcements before we conclude our services this evening. I want to thank our readers who you saw in recorded video, which we recorded over the last three weeks to make sure we only had one person speaking in the room per day. I want to thank David Quinn and Jonah Hirsch, Rabbi Daniel Friedman, Sheila and Ron Sieber, and Allison Shalom. There are many, many, many people to thank for helping to put together these unprecedented high holiday celebrations. I'm going to be thanking them a few at a time as we go through our New Year's celebrations, but please know you are greatly appreciated. Tonight, I want to be sure to thank Ken Burke and Mitch Apley, who put in tremendous work on our audio and visual recording and preparation, and also our administrator, Jeremy Owens, who ran our webinar tech to make this evening possible. I also want to especially thank our shofar sounders, Jim Jacobs, Stephen Jacobs, and Andy Jacobs, even recorded their Tikiya Gedola at the end still gives me the chills. Following our service tonight, we will be opening a separate Zoom meeting for schmoozing and wishing people a happy new year face to face as a large group and in smaller breakout rooms. Now there's an email going out, I think as I'm speaking uh, at 845 
to let all of our members and all the registrants who signed up know that uh, they can connect to that Zoom meeting. And this will be a conventional Zoom meeting with faces, so make sure you're appropriate <laughs> for being seen. Um, and so you'll have a chance to connect both in the larger room and also in breakout rooms to talk in smaller groups. And that will start at nine o'clock, so you'll have a chance to connect after the services conclude. And again, look to your email for that. We will reconvene tomorrow morning at 10.30 for our Rosh Hashanah adult morning service using the same webinar link as tonight and the same format with our family service to follow at 2 p.m. You do need to register separately for the family service, which will be a Zoom meeting again. And so uh, if you have any questions, you can always email Jeremy, info at kolhadash.com. Our upcoming events are always on our website, in our Shofar newsletter, in our weekly email, including our socially distanced Sukkot Simchat Torah event in a few weeks, which we'll be doing in the parking lot here at the North Shore Unitarian Church, where Kolhadash has its offices and its events. Um, so you can find out more about that on our website. If you're a guest this evening, welcome and thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to sign up to receive more information about our upcoming events, you can contact, again, our administrator, Jeremy, at info at kolhadash.com. On that note, I do want to offer a special thank you to our guests who've joined us tonight from wherever you've joined us. We are very happy to have been able to welcome you to celebrate with us, and we hope you will join us again tomorrow and then on Yom Kippur and perhaps at future programs further into the new year just begun. We'll be online for at least the next few months, and so you'll have a chance to connect from wherever you are. I also want to take this opportunity to wish you all a Shana Tova, a good year, a year of health, a year of happiness, a year of satisfaction and meaning. And so our closing song, which you have in your service booklet, is our choir singing together through the magic of technology to wishing, uh, wishing you a Lashana Tova, a good year, a Shana Shel Ratzon Tov, a year of good resolve, and of course, a Shana Shel Shalom, a year of peace. Once again, I wish you Lashana Tova, and I hope we will see you back together with us either in our schmooze meetings in just a few minutes or in our services tomorrow morning. Good evening. <laughs>